Hello everyone. Today I'm going to share with you what we have done on the GPU side to bring Genshin Impact on PS4. Genshin Impact is an open world RPG game. It has unique graphics style. It is available on multiple platforms and it's free to play. A little about me. My name is Chen Zhong Yi. I've been working on console gaming development for over a decade. I worked at Ubisoft Shanghai after graduation. Then I went to Zendaki Games to make a game for PS4 on 2012, when PS4 was not released yet. Then I joined Avalanche Studios New York to work on Just Cause 3 and 4. My last trip before coming back to Shanghai was at Seattle, working at Microsoft Xbox. 2019, I joined MiHoYu, assembled a team to make Genshin Impact PS4. Now I'm responsible for Genshin Impact console development. These are some games I worked on. Here is today's agenda. First, I'll give some brief introduction about Genshin Impact on PS4 from a developer's point of view. Then I'll talk about how we changed the rendering pipeline to make Genshin Impact more fit to PS4. I'll choose some graphics features and give you more details about them, try to let you know a bit more about all the work we have done to bring Genshin Impact from mobile to console. Okay, let's get started. Genshin Impact is using Unity as our game engine. Unity is very flexible. Its coding style is very neat and clean, which makes it very easy for us to modify different modules. Also, tech support from Unity are actively helping us, very responsive. I want to take the chance to say thank you to Unity. PS4 is a platform for gaming. It's all about games. We spent a lot of time to optimize our game to take advantage of PS4's hardware architecture. We have made some quite nice changes there, but due to Sony's NDA today, I'm not going to sh talk about any of those. No hardware details, no low-level optimizations. Since we are going to focus on graphics, there will be no CPU or I.O. related contents either. The first is a console rendering pipeline overview. We have a dedicated engine team to work on modifying Unity engine. Genshin Impact has two different rendering pipelines for mobile platforms and the console platforms. But the foundation is the same. The game is PBR based non photorealistic rendering. PS4 was started later than mobile platforms, but soon caught up. Then PS4, PC, mobile platforms began to develop in parallel. Content creating, feature developing would take all platforms into consider. Our game has 24 hour time cycle. It has dynamic weather system. So the, t the lighting is changing constantly. Making the game PBR based is good to make the game look right under all lighting conditions. We will for sure modify materials based on the art team's needs, since our game is non-photorealistic. On PS4 Pro, we stick to native 4K resolution. On PS4 Base, we render the scene with 1440p, then we output the final image to 1080p. This way, we can make the game look clean and crispy. We used Compute Shader a lot. Actually, more than half of the console pipeline features used Compute Shader. On platforms that support async compute pipe, we can take advantage of that to hide more GPU cost. The art team, the art team of Genshin Impact has different requirements on how the game should look like comparing to photoreal photorealistic games, especially on lighting. Simply implementing techniques that those games used into our game just won't work. Dark, dirty, noisy, are likely what you all hear from the art team. They like clean, crispy, bright, like the feeling of, cut, of anime. All the features we added to the game have to spend 
a lot of time to tweak, to adapt until our artists think it can blend into our game harmonically. Some of the features I'm going to talk about are still in the middle of this process. So when we started Genshin Impact PS4, what were we facing? First, we have an engine that has been heavily modified for mobile platforms. This means we can't just click we can't just click the switch platform button and call it a day. Lots of the features were developed without considering PS4. That's already a lot of work to do. We also plan to add a lot of features to make Genshin Impact look good and run fast enough on PS4. That's more work to do. Then we have PS4 account, PS4 store, PS4 TRC. They all mean more work. But back then, I was the only person in the console dev team, a leader with all a leader with no one to lead. There were few people who had experience of console game development. Everyone is making mobile game in China. So I had to build up a team while working on PS4 from the ground up. We only had about one year and a half to work on PS4 version, including pre preparing for events like China Joy and the TGS. Thanks to our great dev team of Genshin Impact, they've been working really hard and they are all full of passion, so we finally made it. Since we are very limited on resources and time, we had to choose what we should do carefully. We excluded any features that, it, that needs non-researching time. We only choose techniques we know for sure how we are going to implement it. We choose features that can greatly improve the game's visual quality and ideally, the features can have impact on other features. Also, most importantly, features that can fit with our visual style without spending too much time to tweak. Let's get into all the tech details. I'm going to talk about some lighting related features we picked from our pipeline, and we only focus on the methodology. So first one is shadow from directional lights. Genshin Impact is an open world game Lots of players' time will be spent outdoor, so the sun or moonlight shadow quality is very important. We want high quality details in nearby shadow, and also we want the shadow to cover large distance, since you can see really far in Genshin Impact. 800 meters is 800 meters is the distance we can cover in Genshin Impact. How about the details? Here is a screenshot. If you zoom in that small red circle you will see it has a lot of details. You can even see the shape of each leaf and also the shadow is very stable. The edge of shadow is very soft. We are pretty happy about the quality of the shadow. So how did we achieve that? We use cascaded shadow map and the personalized soft shadows. Instead of regular three or four cascades, we used eight cascades. It's very brute force. Increasing the cascade count does improve the shadow quality, but also it costs a lot more on both CPU and the GPU side. So there's a reason other titles don't do this. Now how do we solve it? First is the CPU side. We used shadow cascade cache. There will be only five cascades update per frame. First four cascades will be updated every frame. Then the next four cascades will be updated at least once every eight frames. We will only update one of them every frame. So that's five in total. The joker count drops a lot by doing this. On the GPU side, we had to do, we had to do more. We use screen space shadow map to generate shadow. For every pixel on screen, we do 11 types personalized soft shadow calculation. To eliminate the repetitive pattern, we also rotate sample coordinates per pixel. So that's a lot of calculations. With eight cascades, the GPU cost of screen space shadow map went to up to two milliseconds to 2.6 milliseconds. It was about 0.5 to 0.8 higher than before. But do we really need to do all that work for every pixel? 
the soft shadow only matters at the edge of the shadows. So what we did was we generated a shadow mask texture, which masks the pixels as in shadow, out shadow, or on the edge. When in screen space shadow map, we only apply soft shadow calculations on pixels which are marked as on the edge. Other, sh other pixels will just return 0 or 1. The GPU cost went down by 30%. So this is a debug view of shadow mask texture. Pixels marked with red color are on the edge areas. Other pixels are just in or out shadow. As you can see, we don't have to do the heavy soft shadow calculations on most pixels. So how did we generate this mask texture? The mask texture is a texture with quarter by quarter resolution. Every mask pixel represents 16 pixels of screen space shadow pass. For these 16 pixels, we just calculate if each of them are in shadow a lot. Then we sum them up. You get the result of this 4x4 block. By doing this, you will have a mask texture with accurate mask value, but it was still too slow to us. By doing this, we gain some GPU time, but not enough. So instead of doing this 16 times, we carefully choose only a few samples, use them to represent the whole 4x4 block. Now it's much faster, but it's not accurate anymore. So we noticed areas that should be marked as shadow edge, but didn't. To fix it, we added a blur pass on shadow mask texture, expanded the shadow edge areas a bit. Artifacts went away. This whole shadow mask generation took only about 0.3 milliseconds. You can check out these two pictures for comparison. This is off, this is on, off, on. You can't even notice any difference on the shadow, but these are actually two different pictures with shadow optimizations on and off. OK, so now we have directional shadow taken care of. Let's take a look at the ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is very important, especially when characters or objects are already in shadow. It helps quite a lot to make characters or objects feel like standing on the ground not floating in the air. To have proper AO, we actually use three different techniques targeting on three different situations. First is the HBAO. It is a full screen effect, pretty standard. I'm not going to talk much about it. For static objects, we apply AO volume. For characters, we have capsule AO for them. These two pictures are comparing HBO on and off. You can see the difference is quite obvious. Now we're comparing AO volume. Please pay more attention on areas in the red circle. The chair casts soft shadow on the ground when AO volume is on. Nice. So AO volume is good in simulating cases like desk or chair casting shadows on ground. Because of the performance limit and the algorithm limit, HBO can't capture this type of behavior. To make, H, uh, to make AO volume work at runtime, first, we need to offline bake some occlusion information of the object itself in its local space. The occlusion information then is stored and injected into a volume texture to be sampled at runtime. For more detail, you can check the presentation made by Nathan Reed at GDC 2012. This is a comparison with capsule AO on and off. Please take a look, take a close look at the areas in red circles. When capsule AO is on, you can see nice soft shadow are cast on folding screen and the ground. The shadow also has a shape that looks close to Xiangning. It also changes when Xiangning makes different moves. We mentioned that AO volume 
is used on static objects. Because the uh, occlusion is baked offline, so we can't use it for characters, as characters has animation. They are changing shape all the time. So what, we're, what we do in Capsule AO is that we use a few capsules wrapping around arms, necks, and torso. Then attach these capsules to skeleton nodes so that they can be updated with the animation. These capsules will also will then be used to calculate occlusion information in two ways. One is to calculate a long directional environment occlusion. Then, and uh, the other is to calculate occlusions with an approximated main occlusion direction, which was blend between the main light direction and the normal direction. So you can get soft shadow on both ground and uh, nearby walls. Uh, this is a simple optimization we made when applying AO. So all AO passes render to a half by half resolution target. To make sure the final result is not so noisy, we added a blur pass, then upsample AO to a full screen texture. To avoid wrong AO information bleeding into nearby pixels, both blur and up sampling passes use bilateral filter. Now you can see we have two blur passes and one up sampling pass, which means AO data will be written out and read in multiple times. If you know bilateral filter, you will find that lots of calculations are pretty much the same among nearby pixels. So to optimize all this, we merge blur and upsampling pass into one compute pass. We use LDS to store blur results, and we output four pixels per thread instead of one pixel per thread. So we can reuse a lot of uh, intermediate calculation result. And we can throw this into ASIN compute pipe to further hide the GPU cost. Local light. We implemented a cluster different lighting for local lights. We up to 1024 lights in view can be supported. The screen is split into 64 by 64 pixel tiles on 4K resolution. Each tile then divided into 16 clusters along depth direction. Uh, let's say a debug view of the local lights, you can see there's a lot. So this picture shows multiple local lights casting shadows on screen. You can see characters have multiple shadows projecting on direction on different directions. The local light system we implemented in Genshin Impact supports close to 100 local lights casting dynamic shadows in view frustum. We can support more, but this should be enough. The resolution of shadow maps are adjusted automatically based on priority and the view distance. The final shadow of each local light is a mixture between pre-baked static shadow, shadow texture and the shadows casted by dynamic objects each frame. So we have a lot of local lights in our game, and the shadow texture can't just simply be compressed with BCN compression. The artifacts would be too obvious to ignore. So we need a good compression algorithm, which have minimal precision loss and is fast dec to decompress at runtime. And also, the compression rate should be high enough. The compression algorithm we have in Genshin Impact compressed shadow textures offline with a pretty good precision and is pretty fast to decompress at runtime. For 1K by 1K shadow texture, it only takes 0.05 milliseconds on PS4 base. Uh, here's some details. First, we encode two by two blocks into 32 bits. If the, if the artists choose high precision compression, the two by two blocks 
will be encoded into 64 bits. Encoding can use either depth plane mode or packed floating data. After encoding, data will be compressed further by stored into quad tree. Every 16 by 16 blocks turn into one tile, and each tile has one quad tree. The quad tree step is where we increase the compression rate the most. Uh, these three pictures you see from left to right are depth value view, depth plane view, and the quad tree depth view. The Bo Li talked about this similar technique at SIGGRAPH 2019. You can find more details if you are interested. Let's check out the numbers, see how well the compression algorithm works. With default precision mode, a typical indoor scene, we have a compression rate at 20 to 30. In high precision mode, the compression rate, compression rate is about 40% to 70% comparing to default precision mode. In either mode, we lower the size of shadow texture significantly. Uh, some comparison between default precision compression and uh, high precision compression. You can check the, these two pictures uh, to see the quality difference. Please look at the areas in red circles. Uh, this is actually the worst case we can find. In most cases, we don't see much difference. In high precision mode, we don't find any difference comparing to uncompressed shadow texture, so I didn't bother to put two identical textures there. The above scene is using 2K by 2K shadow texture. So the uncompressed texture size is eight, meg eight megabytes. With default precision mode, the size becomes to 274.4 kilobytes. The compression rate is almost 30. It's 29.85. With high precision mode, the size increased to 583.5 kilobytes the compression rate is still have about 14, so that's pretty good. So now, local lights are also done. So next feature we are going to talk about is volumetric fog. Volumetric fog can be lit by local lights. You can see the halo around the light, also the building in the back of this picture gets fuzzy because the surrounding fog is lit by lights in that area. This picture is more interesting. If we add a projection texture to control the shape of local light, that shape will reflect on volumetric fog. Volumetric fog is calculated by physically based light scattering. The artists they can set different parameters to control volumetric fog in different areas in the world to make volumetric fog look more stable and more smooth. We added a temporal filter on it. Mixed multiple, multiple frames result. The total GPU cost is normally less than one millisecond on PS4 Pro. So the volumetric fog is camera view based. We split view frustum into voxels. These voxels are aligned with clusters in cluster different lighting system so that we can speed it up when we add local light information into volumetric fog. Fog parameters and local light data will be injected into these, these voxels. Later, when we're marching through those voxels, the local light will automatically make an impact on the final result. Once we have volumetric fog, talking about guard rays become very large. Only. So let's take a look at the guard ray effect in Genshin Impact. We have a separate path to generate guard ray it is done by remarching, sampling up to five cascades. 
The result is written into a half by half resolution texture, then mixed with volumetric fog, with parameters are controlled by artists. People who know about volumetric fog now might have a question. Volumetric fog itself can give guttery effect, so why bother making another pass to do that? Actually, this is a good example showing how we have to change regular techniques to fit into our game. There are two main reasons that volumetric fog generated guttery is not good enough for our game. First, the resolution is not high enough. We want crispy, sharper rays. That's not something we can achieve in volumetric fog while keeping a reasonable GPU cost. Second, the intensity of guard ray highly depends on the density of volumetric fog. If you want more noticeable guard ray, you have to increase the fog density, which looks too dirty to our, for our artist's taste. So we chose to generate guard rays in a separate pass, then blend with volumetric fog in an artist-controllable way. To check out these two pictures, you will know what I'm talking about. The first picture shows guard ray from volumetric fog. You can see how fuzzy the rays are and how heavy the fog become. Then take a look at the, the second picture, which shows how guard rays look like with a separate pass. This is what Genshin Impact actually uses. The rays are sharper, more noticeable, and the whole screen is much cleaner. So volumetric fog, separate guard ray pass. Next topic is our image-based lighting. Let me show you a video first. The, probes, the probe on the left is a reflection probe. The probe on the right is an ambient probe. See how them change when time of day cycles. Uh, first, let's talk about reflection probe. Reflection probe is used to provide if reflection data for rendering. Since lighting is constantly changing in Genshin Impact, we can't simply bake one cube map and use it. Instead, for every probe, we saved a mini G buffer, then generate cube map from mini G buffer at runtime. The artists they can place as many probes as needed. The process of generating runtime reflection probe takes three steps, relight, convolve, and compress. With compute shader, we can handle all six phases at the same time. Async compute pipe can be used here to save more GPU time, of course. We will update all probes once, one at a time, endlessly. Relight is a process taking current in-game light condition, generating a cube map with mini G buffer. It's easy to understand with these pictures. Then we need to convolve and uh, compress the cube map. The convolve process properly generate all MIPS for the cube map. Last step, we make a BC6 edge compression so that we can use the cube map in a more GPU-friendly way. Now let's talk about ambient probe. Ambient probe is also generated at runtime. After we finish in relight step for reflection probe, we have a cube map which can reflect current lighting condition. We can pull out ambient information from it and save that as SH values. This is done automatically after finishing reflection probe process. We also use computer to handle all six phases together. Now we have a proper system which can give us real-time reflection probes and ambient probes. But wait, there are quite a few places we can improve. First, 
we don't have shadow in relate path. Ground, which is supposed to be in shadow, now looks very bright. Sometimes reflection probe and ambient probe can look pretty bad, so we need shadow. But we can't afford generating real-time shadow for it, so how do we fix that? Every couple hours, we bake the shadow map for mini G buffer and save it into a 3-band shadow SH. At runtime, we simply interpolate between two shadow SHs by the time of day. Then apply it on, rel on relight result. The result is pretty good and uh, it's really cheap. Same idea, we also convert local light information into 3-band SH, save it, and apply during relight process. This introduces some nice local light bouncing into the scene. You can check out the comparison. So with shadow SH on, the light leaking issue is improved drastically. So this is off, this is on. This is a comparison of local light SH on and off. Just look at the dark areas on the right up corner, see how them get it when we turn on the local light SH. See. Kind of nice. The next issue we are going to solve is the indoor outdoor issue. Lighting can be very different between indoor scene and outdoor scene, but without a proper solution, we can't tell if a pixel is indoor or outdoor. The scene can look quite strange. To solve this issue, we separate reflection probes and ambient probes into indoor and outdoor types. The artists then also need to place interior mesh to properly wrap the indoor scene so that indoor pixels can be marked correctly. Then, when applying reflection probes and ambient probes, we can make sure all pixels need by the right probes. Now is a comparison. See how blue the indoor areas are without the interior mask? and how it changes when interior mask is on. Off, on. We also made some soft transition between indoor and outdoor scenes so that you don't see any hard edge when that condition changes from indoor to outdoor. This is how interior mask look like. The red pixels are marked as indoor scene. Besides reflection probe, we also use screen space reflection to generate real-time reflection. The SSR cost about 1.5 milliseconds on PS4 Pro. We also have a temporal filter on SSR result to state to stabilize the image and make and make it looking smoother. To trace as much information as we can, we generate a high Z buffer and use it in SSR parts so that each ray can trace through the whole screen. This is a comparison. See how the game looks with and without SSR. This is without, this is with, without, with. As you can tell from the previous pictures, reflection probes can provide some reflection data even when SSR is turned off. We use a deferred reflection path to apply reflection probes and ambient probes. We also take ambient occlusion into consider when apply reflection probes. This helps to reduce light leak artifacts. This is the last feature for today, HDR display. It includes the whole pipeline change we made to support HDR display device. When talking about HDR display, it means two things. First is about luminance. HDR pipeline uses uh, PQST2084 as transfer function. This allows for the display of HDR image with a luminance level of up to 10,000 nits. The second is about color space. HDR pipeline uses REC2020 
color space comparing to Rec. 709, which is what current HDTV are using. Rec. 2020 can have a much wider coverage in CIE 1931 color space up to 75.8%, where Rec. 709 only covers 35.9%. So from this page on, we are going to refer pipelines meet above two standards as HDR pipeline, the rest as SDR pipeline. There are lots of talks about are talking about HDR, so we are not going to repeat all the knowledge in common. We will only focus on what we have done to adapt HDR into Genshin Impact. This is a picture of how SDR pipeline and the HDR pipeline look like in Genshin Impact. There is no tone mapping in HDR pipeline. The color grading becomes HDR color grading. The replacement of tone mapping is RRT plus ODT, which is the ACES tone mapping. The RRT plus ODT part is grayed out. We will get back to it later. Also in HDR pipeline, the UI renders into a separate RT, then blend with scene at the end of the pipe. Genshin Impact will support HDR10 mode on version 1.2 on PS4. Since white color gamut is used in HDR mode, Genshin Impact will support HDR10 mode on version 1.2 on PS4. Since white color gamut is used in HDR mode, the artists they need to author HDR color grading a lookup table in software like Divency. At runtime, white balance, HDR color grading, and color expansion will all be combined in one compute pass to generate a small color lookup table. Since this lookup table is small, even though there are a lot of calculations, the GPU cost is still pretty low. It's only 0.05 milliseconds. Uh, in previous page, we saw that RRT plus ODT is grayed out. That's because RRT plus ODT is widely adopted by many games, but it is not a good fit of Genshin Impact. So instead, we blend HDR scene with tone mapped result, so that we can have similar result in places where scene intensity is not high enough. So one issue we are talking about here is a uh, when outputting image to TV, an OETF is applied uncolored. In SDR pipeline, this OETF is equivalent to a gamma 2.2. When TV receives the image, it applies the EOTF on it. In BT1886, it's gamma 2.4. So these two transforms don't cancel out. But in HDR pipeline, the PQ and the inverse PQ are the EOTF and OETF. They do cancel out. So there's a mismatch. We add an OETF in HDR mode to simulate this mismatch in HDR pipeline so that the HDR pipeline output can look closer to SDR output, especially in low luminous level regions. The last issue about HDR is a huge shift issue. Take a look at those pictures. It shows how we get the fire in game. So there is a grayscale mask texture and a low ice texture. The grayscale mask texture is distorted by the low ice to get the shape of flame. Then an orange color is applied. After that, very high intensity is multiplied on top. So now is the magic part. Since SDR has tone mapping, the tone mapping curve will slow down the growth speed when a channel's value is high. So the R channel and the G channel in orange color has a big delta. But when they both get brighter, tone mapping comes in, makes R channel increasing slower than G channel. The delta becomes uh, between these two channels becomes smaller which turns the orange color into yellow. So that's a huge shift we're talking about. You can see in the picture, 
the or orange flame becomes yellow in the center. So that's what artists want with the help of tone mapping. The problem is we don't have that in HDR pipeline. So what's orange will always stay orange, no matter how high the intensity becomes. So how to fix that? Normally, other games would take a solution called black body radiation. Basically, instead of specifying color and intensity, you specify temperature. Then by doing some physically based calculation, you get a proper color. This is not what we use in Genshin Impact though. The HDR feature is added recently, so we have a lot of assets relying on hue shift. It is a lot of work for artists to change them. Plus, Genshin Impact is not photorealistic style, so the fire can be any color. So what we did to solve this issue is that we mimic the hue shift in shader, combine it in the color, color lookup table generation pass. It works really well, and it's really cheap. What's better is that since we mimic the hue shift, we actually have tone mapping curve in our color lookup table now. So we don't have to blend the HDR scene with tone mapped result, as we mentioned before. That's all the tech topics we covered today. The global player's acceptance of Genshin Impact on the PS4 platform has far exceeded our expectations. And for that, we are both moved and humbled. We will continue to make more improvements, a better performance, faster loading time, more stability, more graphics features that suit the game's style. It is the first time we try to bring our game on console platform. It will not be the last time. So when we make Genshin Impact PS4, the time is limited, the resources are limited. The team requires talents of all sorts. We also gain a lot of experience by working on this project. There's so much we want to do under the new generation of console is coming. We look forward for more opportunities to exchange development experience with other developers. So now this is the uh, hiring time. Last, we want to say thank you to the entire Genshin Impact engine team Says thank you to every member who contribute to Genshin Impact. We also want to thank, thank the special member of the console dev team, Lulu. A very special thanks to Wen Li Chen, Terry Liu, and all the global tech support specialists at Soli for all the help, for all the support they have given us. Thank you all, that's 